I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, we're continuing the look in our series today into the book of Titus, God's call in the life of this man as he led God's people on the island of Crete thousands of years ago as he called them to live the good life. Uh, you know, yesterday someone gave me tickets to go to an army football game up at West Point. Has anybody been to West Point? It is an amazing place if you have ever been there. I hadn't been since I was eight years old. Uh, but walking on those grounds, you just have this sense of the importance, the, 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 the integrity, the, the values, the, the virtues that the men and women who come to serve there are aligning themselves with as they seek to protect, as they seek to care for something they treasure, their nation, their country. You know, what are the things in your life that you value, that you treasure so much that you want to make sure is safe, is cared for, is defended this morning? Uh, for some of us this morning, uh, we woke up, and I want to ask you, the, the first question you might, well, all of us this morning woke, woke up, but when we woke up this morning, uh, some of us had an uh, issue come to our mind right away, or a person come to our mind right away. Or a challenge come to our mind right away. And I want you to think what that was for you. For me, the first thought that comes to my mind every morning is, I need a cup of coffee. Then after that, after that initial thought, what is it? I'm going to suggest this morning that that's oftentimes something we value and treasure greatly. Some of you woke up this morning and you're thinking about your family. Perhaps concerned about whether you'll be able to provide for them. Perhaps you're concerned about a family member and how far they have fallen away from the Lord. Perhaps you're concerned about a, a job that you don't think might be there in the coming days. Perhaps you woke up this morning and you're concerned about how you're going to take care. How are you going to pay the bills? Or maybe there's somebody in your life that's going through such a physical struggling time, a time of sickness, and, and you're concerned for them, whether it's physical emotional, spiritual, whatever it might be, a family member, a friend, a colleague, and they come to your mind right away. Why? Because you love them. You value them. You care about them. And you want to see them do all right. Some of us wake up this morning and the things that we have treasured, the things that come to our mind first and foremost are not such good things. Perhaps some of us are really concerned with our reputation. Or really concerned with more people finally realizing you are right. And some of us this morning are treasuring things in this world that even if we receive them, we will not be happy. What do you treasure? What do you value? Who do you care about this morning? And that's why it's always important for us to gaze our attention to the Word of God daily and then as we gather as God's people each week to remind ourselves what God says we should truly treasure and value most. That God placed uh, in the words of Paul these words of encouragement to Titus, his young protege, to encourage him in the midst of the world that was saying, treasure all these other things. Paul says to Titus, Ensure that the thing that matters the most to you is your love, your commitment, the treasuring and the protecting of the good news of Jesus Christ in your life, about the gospel, the good news that gives you hope. And this morning, we're going to see from God's word that we will be tempted in this world we will be tempted this side of eternity to place our hope and treasure in areas and in individuals and in outcomes that even if we receive them will not last. But that God invites us to place our hope in the treasure of the gospel so much so that we'll fight for it and we'll share it and we'll care about it more than we care about our reputation, more than we care about our pocketbook, more than we care about more people finally in your family agreeing with you on this thing, but that together we might be a people that say, 
God and the gospel and the hope of Jesus matters most in my life, and I'm going to make every decision in light of him. Are you with me this morning? So turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Titus chapter 1, beginning here in verse 10. For there are many rebellious people, full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by their teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and commands of people who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Whoa, we read a scripture like this and we think, Pastor Mike, (laughs) sounds like an intense morning. (laughs) Whoa, Uh, you read a scripture like this and you think, wow, what what must have been going on with Titus and Crete that, that Paul felt he needed to be on record and that God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, have saw fit to preserve this so that thousands of years later, we might read into this situation and see truth that is applicable for us today. I want us to notice from this text this morning at least two things that I believe are so applicable for us in 21st century New York City that we need to be mindful of as we seek to treasure the gospel of Jesus. The first is this, that we, like Titus in Crete, live in a challenging culture. And that is about as vanilla a word as I could have chosen for our culture. (laughs) Notice the quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Notice he quotes it in verse 12 here. This is a quote that believes, most believe comes from the 6th century B.C., 600 years prior to the time of Paul and Titus, where one of their own prophets, Epimenides, makes this statement. Now, what do you think about this as the moniker by which your town is known? Their island is known. I mean, New York, we have a lot of good monikers, don't we? Uh, The Big Apple, Gotham, the city that. All right, you knew that one, okay. I'm not going to ask you to quote anymore. Imagine if we were known as Staten Island. Ah, we are always liars. I mean, imagine. God called Titus to go to an island that valued so much these lines that for 600 years, this has been what they want to share to people when they think about them. Uh, Another quote, this is from a few centuries later, just 200 years prior to the time of Titus. He says this, uh, Polybius, uh, an ancient historian, almost impossible to find, listen to this, personal conduct more treacherous or public public policy more unjust than in Crete. I mean, this is what you're known for. You are in a challenging culture. One more, just within 100 years of the writing of Paul and Titus from Cicero, another uh, ancient historian. He says, moral principles are so divergent that the Cretans consider highway robbery honorable. I mean... They're so synonymous with evil and wrongdoing and sinister motives that even today, have you ever called somebody, you Cretan, you know? It even lasts to our day, thousands of years later. Can you believe it? This is where God called Titus to be a minister of the hope of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of a verse from Isaiah chapter 5. I shared it this week in our midweek study with our life groups. It's in Isaiah chapter 5, a section of scripture where Isaiah the prophet is actually talking to the nation of Judah. 
Okay, so he's talking to God's people, the nation of Judah here in chapter 5, and he is reminding them, God's people, of how far they have fallen as a result of identifying so much with the culture around them. He says, woe to those who only call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Do you hear the words of the prophet Isaiah? Woe to anyone who lives in such an upside down world like this, where you would call good evil and evil good. Does it feel that way for us sometimes? In the world in which we live? In the values that we see espoused? Perhaps for some of us, even in the families in which we grew up in, things that we knew were wrong were called good. And the good was made fun of and diminished. It's a challenge for us, whether we live in the challenging culture of Crete in the first century, or whether we live in New York City in 2021. How will we live distinctively for Christ in a culture adverse to the truth of God? Or perhaps in a family or in a background that was adverse to the things of the Lord? You know, there are several ways that we usually respond when we look out in the world and we realize that we are overcome by evil and not by good. And we think the way to live distinctively in this world is to complain. And some of us know those Christians that, man, they are good at pointing the finger and complaining complaining about what should happen here and who should do what there. Complaining, complaining, almost to the point where they find themselves in despair. And perhaps you've walk, woke up like that recently. Perhaps something that has gone on either in your close sphere of influence or in the world around you, something that you know is evil that has been said good. You have woken up and you have complained about it enough, but now you feel despair, sadness, and and grief about the changes that are occurring and your lack of control, a desire for there to be more. But you know, uh, when we oftentimes uh, uh, complain and then come into despair, then the temptation is to attack, to, to fight evil with evil, to, to lash back out the way in which you feel as if it has been perpetrated against you. Have you ever fought like that, scrappy, in the pit, on the same terms as the world and your own flesh? The question for us this morning is, why do we expect more from the world, the flesh, and the devil than the scriptures tell us they will ever be able to give us? Why do we treasure more the hope that we think we could find in this world than the hope that God tells us he offers us in this and in the next. I was reminded this week of Romans 12 and what it says. It says that do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. It's what we're talking about in Titus, living the good life. That how are we to respond when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel as if the challenges and the adversities are so great, when we feel as if the attacks are so strong in our life? We are not to put up our dukes and say, oh, let's go at it. Some of us right away revert back to our old ways of fighting. Are you with me? And we're willing to, to wage war on terms that will not give satisfaction in the end. The Lord tells us, to not be conquered by evil, but to overcome evil with good. In places where we see injustice, to, to cry out for justice and righteousness and peace. In situations where we see slander, to speak truth. In situations where we feel overwhelmed by what society is demanding of us to stand up and say, no, I'm going to stand for what is right. I'm going to hold forth the truth. I'm going to share the hope and the forgiveness and the love of Jesus. You know, it reminds me in the scriptures in Romans as well, it says that, 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 that it is the kindness 
of God that leads to repentance. It's a reminder to us that, that we too at one time were enemies and, and adverse to the truth of God, and yet it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. God graciously pointing out in our life where we fall short and drawing us to himself. That God offers that to us. That God calls us to do the same in our life, to be people that love good so much that we are willing to stand for it in a way that is at peace, like we have prayed already this morning, surrendering control to him. In what situation this morning do you need to surrender control? In what situation and challenge in your life this week do you need to say, Lord, I'm not going to be overcome by evil. I'm going to respond in holiness and in goodness and in righteousness and in love and in peace. Because we're going to live in a challenging world. And the scriptures do not promise ease and comfort or that the world will agree with us. But he does promise that when we stand up for him, he's with us in the midst of it. And we see as well that it's not just that we live in a challenging culture, but that oftentimes the church, the church of God could get confused. And that's what's happening here in Titus chapter 1. Remember, he has just set up his leadership in the church. He says, look for elders, men that will lead with integrity and competency and with great conviction about the gospel. But when you do that, if you are a leader for God in the church, if you're standing up for what is right, you need to be ready to challenge, to, 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 to make sure that you are, are, do not accept a false teachers in your midst. And in the text here, it lays out the description of what these teachers were all about. Uh, for those in the first century still coming out of the Judaism in the background of their day, uh, they were still wrestling with what it meant to, to know and follow Jesus, but yet have the allegiance to their upbringing and the religion of their, of their upbringing. And, and, and so there were many that, that would say, in order to follow Jesus, you need to trust in him for sure. But in addition to this, continue to practice these practices that set us apart. It, the, they list some of them out here. Circumcision. Uh, this section there about the pure, everything is pure, and, and uh, the defiled, the nothing is pure. The idea of what one eats, of what one puts in their body, that, that, that they're, they're no longer holding you to these standards that you once had to believe and hold to. Uh, talking about this idea that they are doing this. They are adding things to the gospel. And in so doing, placing a weight and a burden. And then it says as well that these false teachers, what are they doing? They're doing this in order to get money dishonestly. Isn't that interesting? No, the scriptures say that the, the, the love of money is the root of, well, not all evil, but all kinds of evil, okay? And lots of, lots of kinds. <laughs> uh, the, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil even with seemingly good intentions, that it could warp our heart's motives. And here we see in the text, he's saying that they're sharing this false teaching, this false gospel, with the hope of padding their own pockets for their gain. And he says to the leaders, and leadership is not for the faint of heart, part of your responsibility is to do what? To address it, to confront it. That the work of the church and its leadership is to ensure there is a commitment, a fidelity to the gospel because the gospel, when it is lost, it destroys us. He says that it is destroying families. Look what it says. It's destroying whole households, whether that was the households of these house churches or the individual families that were a part of it, that the accepting of these false teaching in such a way, it goes down to the very root and fabric of who you are as a community. And that, yes, we live in a challenging culture, but the church can't be confused. We need to make the main thing, the main thing, the main thing. Are you with me? All the time. And go back to it again and again. And what was happening here in Crete could happen to any church in any time and in any place in history. The temptation to say, yes, I love Jesus. Yes, the gospel is good, but add a little extra to make sure it counts. And any adding of extra 
means that we're not committed to the core. Are you with me this morning? I, I want to talk through a couple questions because we live in, we live in a, a world now where, where you could leave here and, 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 and Google on your phone and watch on YouTube any teacher or so-called prophet or download any book to your phone in an instant or read any article or blog post and think, uh, you know, maybe this is true. Maybe this is right. And I want to encourage you with four questions that I go through all the time to make sure that what I am feeding and thinking and meditating on in my life is true and committed to the truth of God and the gospel. Here's the first one. If you ever hear a teacher, a prophet, a, a, a religion saying that they demand allegiance at all costs and that there's no wavering from that individual person, then you should do what? Run. You, it, it, this is an issue. I got a text this week from somebody who was asking me about this teaching, and this person that they were interested in, and how they were giving them some really interesting insights. And I look it up, and literally, and I love the, the, the honesty of this individual, right on their front page of their website, they say, I'm basically, you know, believe me or you are wrong. Be allegiant to my ministry and my my church, otherwise you are damned. You know what I told the person? This was an easy one. It was like between sips of coffee. I'm like, heretic, avoid it. Uh, but if we're not careful, we can be tempted. And perhaps some of us in the past have been by a strong leader who went a certain direction and we thought, ah, they must be right all the time. If any demands allegiance, run away. I, I had a friend at, a, 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 at our church that we were at prior to here in Midtown Manhattan. It was a young woman who was a graduate of an Ivy League school, uh, working in a career in, in, in Manhattan, just really excelling, doing well. Super, super sharp, smart, uh, loved the Lord. And then all of a sudden, she's with us for months and months in our church, and then she disappears. And we're saying, what happened to so-and-so? Where, where, where is she at? And, and we had some of our friends that were friends of hers. They said, reach out, try to find her. Now, in, New York, in Manhattan, it's a, it's a little bit different. You can't just show up at someone's door and start knocking, right? People live in, like, apartment buildings. You've got to get past the doorman. It's a whole thing, you know? And, and so finally, somebody got to her. And she said, oh, I found this church. She listed the church. And she said, and they said that your pastor is dangerous. Now listen, I've been called a lot of things, a lot of things recently. <laughs> I've never been called dangerous. <laughs> they said to her to avoid him, avoid that church, and only listen to us. So we prayed for this girl, you remember, for months, months. She would not even allow us to in infiltrate in any way. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, it took almost a year before God released her from the bondage of that false teaching and brought her back to the Lord. Run away. Run away if you are told by whatever church or whatever leader or, or, or whatever side little interest group that I am the only way, that this is the proper way, that follow me or you're damned. Be careful, brothers and sisters, against such kind of teaching. It destroys the gospel because it says the gospel is good, but my interpretation of how it should be applied is perfect. And that's incorrect. It's incorrect. Another question I want you to work through uh, when we think about this as well in our life is, is, do they add anything to Scripture? Do they say, yes, the Scriptures are good, yes, the Gospel is good, but this other book is equally as important, or this modern-day prophet gives us new insights, or you need to do this in addition to it. This is what was going on there in Titus. Anything that adds to the authority of God's Word, be weary, be mindful, be careful. Another question that we asked is, what did they say about Jesus? Is Jesus truly the God-man who came and lived and died and rose again on our behalf? Is he truly God in the flesh, 100% man, 100% God? And there is one God. This is, this is the, the doctrine of, 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 of Christ, that 100% man, 100% God, but, but one person. Do they say, yeah, Jesus was a great teacher, 
Or Jesus is a great legend and story in the past that we want to ideologically try to live into and follow. Anything that adds and changes the way the scriptures and the church has always described and talked about Jesus, be wary. Be mindful. Lastly, another question for us. How do they define the gospel? And that's what, what Timothy really is working through. Are they saying, yes, follow Jesus, but yes, do these other things in order to have allegiance and safely? How do they define the gospel? Because it is a good news to be treasured. The good news that Jesus is Savior and Lord. The good news that you could be forgiven. That I can be forgiven. That's through simple repentance and trust in him. We have eternity secured. This is the good news. How do they define it? If it's Jesus plus anything, run away. Here's the bottom line from these verses today. Confront falsehood when you see it. And treasure the good news. Treasure the good news. The gospel. There's a story, a metaphor that, that, that Jesus uses in Matthew 13. And I want to share that today in closing. He uses this metaphor in one of his parables. The parables in Matthew 13, it's the third large section of Jesus' teaching in Matthew's gospel. There's five major sections. The third is in Matthew chapter 13. It's his teaching about the kingdom of God. It's his great parabolic teaching about the parables. Uh, Parables are earthly stories with heaven on earthly meanings. That's the way I define parables. They're earthly stories with heaven on earthly meanings. And Jesus uses this amazing parable, it's only one verse long, to remind us of the treasure of the gospel and the treasure of the kingdom and how much it is worth in our life to love and value in the midst of a culture and sometimes a confused church that is going the other way. Listen to the word of God in Matthew 13, 44. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys back the field. I love this one verse parable about the treasure of the kingdom, treasuring the good news, the the gospel of Jesus. Uh, The story is that this man is walking in a field and he sees a nice treasure there. Now, Mike's version of this story would be, you see something that's really good, look around, finders keepers, losers weepers. You know, you put it in your pocket and you keep walking. But that would ruin the whole story here, okay? Uh, The man sees this wonderful treasure, knows it's not his. In fact, he's probably thinking farther ahead than I am. He's recognizing that if I show up with this, people are going to say, where'd you get that from? And the man buries it, hides it. And then the scriptures say, in his joy, I love that line, in his joy, he goes and sells a portion of the things he owned. Is that what it says? It says he sells what? Everything. All right, so now think in your mind, calculate in your mind your net worth. For some of us, it's a lot quicker to calculate than others, okay? Put a price tag on it. Put a price tag of all you own, all you have, all you've invested in. Even add to it. Add what you would expect you may be able to accumulate over the remainder of your life. What are you worth, if you will, in the world's money type of way? And the man, in his joy sells it all so that he could buy that field. Why? Because what was buried in that field far surpasses any value that he could accumulate in this world. What is found in that field, the treasure of the kingdom, is worth so much that it would be a fool's errand to think it was worth keeping that beat up old car or that 401k investment or whatever that other thing or the credit card account or whatever it might be. He's saying it's a fool's job. The the treasure is worth so much. It is that valuable. It is that good. It is that life-giving. It is that purpose fulfilling. It is that encouraging. It is that eternity promising. The good news, the treasure of Jesus is so worth it 
be joyful that you get to get rid of all the baggage and have that. Are you with me this morning? And Paul says to Titus, to know Jesus, to have the gospel, to know by faith what it means to trust him means it is worth pointing out and addressing anyone who might say it's not enough. And it is worth in your life and in your ministry, Titus, to say, I believe in the gospel and in the good news. And I want to preserve it and care for it and love it and treasure it and share it with others. I treasure it so much that like a a, a nation might form an army to protect itself, we desire as well to protect it so much in our life that people might know Mike is about a lot of things, but ultimately, he should be about the gospel. That gateway, you know, we're involved in a lot. We're doing a lot. Ultimately, we care about people understanding the good news of Jesus. That's what it's all about. And, And any one person that says they have the answers to it all and just follow me, run away. The good news is worth so much more in your life. What do you treasure today? Quiz yourself tomorrow morning when you wake up. And you first think, I need coffee, which is okay. I don't judge that. (laughs) Ask that second question. Where does your mind go? Is it about your reputation? Is it about your pocketbook? Is it about the challenges in our world and in our culture? Is it about the fear you have? Or is it about, Lord, may today I treasure and enjoy, follow after the kingdom of God and the good news of Jesus. Are you with me this morning? So let's pray. And I'm going to invite you to do what we did earlier this morning, but you could stay seated. To lay open your hands, palms up before God, right in your seats. As we ask God to give us focus on what truly matters, to keep our eyes on him, that we might confront falsehood and that we might not live overwhelmed in our culture, in our world, but that we might love and value and treasure the gospel, this free gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers us and that we might offer it to others. And if you're here today with your palms up and you've never accepted Jesus, may today be that day where you receive that gift. It's, the scriptures describe it as a gift, that it is a gift of God that he gives us by faith. Not because we're good enough, but because Jesus died for us and forgave us. And when you trust him, he gives you this free gift of life and hope and forgiveness in him. 